So hello everyone and welcome to the Presidential Symposium. We have an interesting program for you and it's kind of in two parts. During the first hour we're going to have a talk from our special guest George Church and then in the second hour we're going to have presented the four top abstracts from the meeting. So it should be really interesting. So I want to start by introducing George. And I've actually known George since we were both graduate students uh, in Wally Gilbert's lab at Harvard during the 1970s. And it was a great time in molecular biology. Uh, cloning had just been invented and DNA sequencing was being invented. Um, and so it was a lot of fun. And I would say even then, George was really thinking big. I remember him and Wally talking about sequencing the whole human genome, even back then when it was kind of an achievement to sequence 50 base pairs. And of course, George did make good on that and went on and uh, uh, created a number of next-gen sequencing methods that have had a huge impact. And his lab has also been involved in uh, gene editing methods and, have, and they've done lots of interesting things uh, with the technology. And I would just say certainly George is one of the world's most creative and uh, accomplished molecular biologists. So it's really a thrill to have him here today with us. And he's going to be talking about uh, some things relevant to gene therapy and talking about synthetic viruses and tissue interactions. So George. Thank, thank you very much, Michelle. I can't think of someone I would prefer to be introduced by. And uh, um, if we can have my slides up there. Uh, those are not my slides, no. Well, I mean, that's just the generic stuff. Anyway, it, uh, I'll just start. I uh, don't, don't really need them. Um, much. <laughs> So, so I'm going to tell you basically three stories, uh, and I'm going to uh, give you this. There we go. That's so that's that's my conflict of interest slide, and uh, and uh, and thank you slide. And I'm going to say a lot of thank yous along the way. So this is the beginning. My real my my clearer, easier to read conflict of interest slide is here. Still still a little cluttered. I'm mainly going to be talking about two stories that have to do with ally therapeutics and dino therapeutics. Uh, who are actually well represented at this meeting. I think Dino has all eight of its employees here. And, uh, and, and, so, and, and they will be presenting, and there will be a tiny overlap, uh, but it's mostly I'm advertising uh, their, their talks. And then I just want to um, also point out uh, uh, some, some other uh, things that might be relevant if you want to talk to me. Uh, the, I'm not going to uh, present slides on them other than this one. Uh, which are uh, kind of context. Uh, so I am in, in uh, nebula genomics is a way to reduce costs of gene therapeutics by eliminating gene therapeutics by essentially doing a, a better job on sequencing genomes and doing di diagnostics. So if you, if you want to know what I mean by that, it's a, it's a zero dollar human genome is the simpler way of saying nebula genomics. And then Rejuvenate Bio is using AAV to deliver what I think is something that that a disease that we will all die of, 90% um, of us will die, desire, die of a disease that does not affect 20-year-olds, um, and so I consider that the largest market, and the, one of the problems with gene therapy is it tends to be very tiny markets and hence very expensive, so I'm hoping this will be a, an anecdote, antidote. Okay. And then, uh, and then I'm not going to talk too much about our work on universal cells, although we're quite uh, excited about that, and I'm sure you, you all know why. And then also I'm not going to talk about uh, the editing that's done at, at uh, Editas or Intellia, where I have a conflict of interest. But I will talk about editing, just briefly at the beginning here. Um, this is a summary. I'll, I'll mention this again at the end. In case some of you are narcoleptic, the way I am, I am an archileptic. I hopefully will make it through the talk, though. And uh, so that we have five approaches to lowering toxicity of multiplex editing. I'm going to try to convince you that it is worth thinking about multiplex editing. There are some examples of it already um, that are making in the clinical trials where you ha edit multiple genes. Um, 
But the punchline here is we've now done 27,000 edits uh, in, in one human cell. Um, so uh, then uh, we're engineering a adeno-associated virus to be intrinsically less immunogenic. It's just a very short piece of DNA that you can put into all your vectors. Um, and then finally, we, we, we studied AAV with new machine learning tools that allow us, that, that are so awesome we found a new gene. And hopefully I'll convince you that we have a new gene. So why do we do multiplex editing? Why on earth would you do more than one gene at a time? And we have um, the, one of the first, uh, and I think fairly compelling reasons, is uh, we're doing xenotransplantation from pigs. Uh, and this required us to, to do 25 changes just to get, the, get rid of the retroviruses, and then another similar number to, to adapt them, uh, to humanize them in terms of their immune system. And, complement and coagulation and sugars and so forth. I'm not going to say anything about the elephant um, other than the word elephant and then in the room. And then uh, in mouse, I'll show you one slide where we, where we have 60 guide RNAs going off uh, simultaneously and changing themselves. So it's the worst case scenario for off target you could possibly imagine, but they're, that they make it through their l little mouse lives. I'll, the 27,000, I already said something about that. And the reason that we want to, the biggest multiplex editing is to make virus-resistant cells. We've, we've demonstrated this now in an industrial microorganism, and we now have an international project that involves 105 labs called Genome Project Right, and it's aimed at making multivirus resistance, but with a very simple trick, which is changing genetic code. More about that in a moment. So here's the uh, the the most ill-conceived uh, uh, guide RNA strategy. This is not our first, our very first paper in 2013. We had beautiful software that would predict off targets and avoid them. This was not used in this case. They're all random guide RNAs scattered all over the genome. And they, worse than that, they keep mutating themselves. They, 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 they home to themselves and change themselves. And they keep generating new targets and new off targets. And nevertheless, these, nevertheless, they persisted, these mice. And these are available right now. Anybody can use them, no strings attached. Um, these can use, mainly used for developmental biology where you want to know the lineage of the, of the animal. Um, these are uh, recently published in Science. I forgot to put the. This, the reference there. This is, this is the two science papers on, uh, that resulted in pigs. We now have herds of these pigs in, in both China and in America. They breed, uh, they, they, and we've uh, fixed not just the endogenous retroviruses, um, but all these other factors. The point for this discussion here is not so much xenotransplantation, it's that it got us thinking about doing repetitive elements. Um, we weren't, ori originally we were repelled by this, um, but it clearly was something that was uh, on the minds of the FDA and many people, and it reflects something um, that I think it's too easy to say, oh, well, maybe this won't be a problem. Well, maybe most people won't have a problem with, uh, a bunch, with every cell and every pig organ releasing in, uh, retroviruses into an immune-suppressed patient. You know, it's like Dirty Harry says, do you feel lucky? Uh, and, and I just don't feel that lucky. And I feel if there's a, if there's a technical solution, we should, uh, we should explore it. So we now have a technical solution. This works in multiple strains of pigs, um, and, and it's relatively easy, and it makes it safer. Uh, they don't produce viruses. But the, again, the relevance here is that as, in making this, we found that just 25 double-strand breaks was extraordinarily toxic. We got essentially zero clones. These are fibroblast engineering. We eventually would do nuclear transfer with the nuclei. We got zero clones that were what we wanted, which were all the retroviruses uh, knocked out in their polymerase gene. And, and we eventually found by reading the literature and trial and error and getting good, cause good friends telling us what to do, that, uh, that these two factors were uh, necessary and sufficient. There's a basic fibroblast growth factor and a p53 inhibitor uh, alpha. And then, so if you look on the, <clears throat> on the right hand side, lower right, essentially everything we got, even after uh, extensive single cell cloning, was 100% uh, 
modified in the uh, knocking out all the retroviruses. So these are the first pigs in the world that, that don't have active retroviruses being produced. And we've shown that both uh, structurally by genome sequencing, but also functionally that they don't produce the viruses. So you give a mouse a cookie and they want more, and so we are not easily satisfied, and so we had knocked out all the endogenous retroviruses, and we said, well, what other repeats and other interesting multi-copy uh, things are in the genome? And these are, this is our, our list. Uh, Ultra-conserved elements are not technically repeats, but there's uh, almost 900 of them. Uh, there are telomeres, the ribosomal DNA, there's the endogenous retrovirus we already addressed, there's simple sequence repeats, there's centromeres, lines, signs, and triplex. So, uh, so we tackled lines next, and I'll show you that. This is the work of, uh, well, first, how we tackled it. We did it with deaminases. And this is something where we, we, we had a, uh, an interesting, um, uh, mostly computational, but we did develop a, a way of sequencing large numbers of uh, putative RNA editing sites uh, back in 2009 before a lot of the tools we have that are at this meeting. And this inspired Lu Han Yang, the same Lu Han Yang that helped us do the pig work, or was first author on the pig work, and she also started eGenesis, and she also was co-author on the first uh, CRISPR paper in, in human stem cells. So she had done quite a bit already. She, she, she left in her wake this uh, deaminase uh, in towels because we didn't have CRISPR at the time. But then David Liu came along, and his lab has really made a big difference um, by switching from towels to CRISPR, uh, which makes a single-stranded DNA. And, and the point is that deamination there's of either Cs to Us to the Ts uh, or As to Gs um, is, is a, is a has a lot of interesting advantages, especially when you're talking about the toxicity of double-strand breaks or even NICs. Now, it turns out most of the base editors, even the, the best ones that David has produced, uh, have involved NICs in one way or another, and you have to work really hard to get rid of these. So that's what we did. We have five different strategies listed here, one through five, that help us lower the toxicity because we managed to overcome the toxicity of 25 double strand breaks with those with the two things at the bottom numbers four and five um, solutions but there still was uh, enough toxicity we had to switch to these deaminase based editors and even there there was toxicity which was due to uh, these NICs and the NICs are not ju not just Cas9 because you can use dead Cas9 no nicking at all there are other NICs that are due to mismatch repair and uracil glycosidase. Once you get rid of all those, then you can get to very, high, very low toxicity and high editing. And I'll show you that in just a moment. This is work of postdoctoral fellow Corey Smith. Oscar Kassanon was a PhD, just got his PhD uh, a couple weeks ago from the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Um, and, then, um, and then Khalid and Verena. So this is doing it in uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells. These tend to be harder than the cell. People tend to like to use 293 cells because they're, I mean, maybe they don't explicitly say it, but they're easier. This, these are harder, but they're more, they're more representative of the kind of cells that we want to work on. So this is uh, uh, I'm only 2,600 edits, I'm sorry. Uh, but this is uh, the dead Cas9 version of the ABE editor from David Liu's lab. The, the adenosine deaminase comes from one of my favorite um, enzymes, which is TAD-A, which uh, deaminates uh, transfer RNA. Anyway, so that's 2,000 edits. And you can see it's not all of them. It's just we managed to find a clone at that level. So there are many, there's still many that, that, are, uh, that have problems. So here's the record. This is 293 T cells. Uh, we get 13,000 per genome, which is about 27 thousand if 293 cells were diploid, which they're not. Uh, they're, they're barely human. Uh, if you're using them, I can give you an alternative uh, strain, which is uh, closer to euploid, or is euploid. It is normal. Okay. Anyway, and the, that's the A editor. The C editor here, sorry, here is, uh, is uh, less. It's, it's, it's 5,700 edits, but it's still uh, significant. So that's the end of that topic. That's, that's multiplex editing. Um, now we want to talk about delivery. 
and we have, we have in the lab uh, a lot of effort on delivering very large packages in the form of cells. I'm not going to tell you anything about that. I'm going to go to the other extreme where we have everybody's favorite but, but a small delivery vehicle, which is AAV. Uh, and this is the team that, they'll present, that it is presented here and, and, and I am very indebted to. Uh, in particular, uh, Kai Chan uh, has done a lot of this work here with, with uh, Jessica and Tina uh, um, and all the collaborators, Connie Sepko in particular. I've, I've had a, a very long and, and uh, wonderful uh, interaction with her in, in our department. Um, like I said, that we had this, this wishful thinking or this hope that, that uh, retroviruses would not be a problem with xenotransplantation. I think we have the same relationship with AV, that, there, that, there sh that it should be. Uh, it is the, one of the lowest immunogenicity vectors in history, and, but it's not all the way. And you can say, well, maybe we'll be able to get it into clinic get it all the way through clinical trials. But I think we need to always worry about the, the corner cases, the occasional person that has uh, particularly at risk. And so we want to step as far back from the, from the edge of the cliff as we possibly can. So here's some examples from this hemophilia, hemophilia B case study uh, where you have immune responses to AAB. I'm not going to go through these in detail. It's not from my lab, but I, I want to congratulate the people who have been bold enough to note um, the, the immune problems with this otherwise best case. A lot of, we think that a lot of these immune problems, even if they're uh, humoral or T-cell mutated, they start as uh, innate immunity problems with the toll-like receptor pathway. When they do, uh, uh, we want, there, there, it turns out there are ways that you can modulate um, the toll-like receptor 9 pathway in a very simple way. Uh, it's a very complicated system, but like many systems, sometimes there are simple fixes. And the fix in this case are a series of inflammation inhibiting oligonucleotides, or IOs. This is IO1 here. We're giving you the sequence so you can just stick it in your vector. Um, but it's just the telomere repeat. It's the human or mammalian telomere repeat of TTAGGG. Um, and it, and that is sufficient for reasons that aren't completely understood um, for inhibiting toll-like receptors 9 in cis with any nucleic acid, or at least with the nucleic acids that we've tested, which are focused on uh, AAV. So in principle, all you need to do is stick this, um, uh, you know, four copies of this uh, hexameric uh, repeat in or some other uh, some other other uh, inflammation inhibiting oligonucleotides into your favorite vector. Here you can see we in, we inserted it in between the ITR and the TTR um, for this vector, um, which is just making factor nine. Doesn't matter particularly. So this is uh, this is some some data from mice where we have. Uh, um, liver, of course, for factor nine. And you can see that, it's, that the innate immune response is greatly decreased um, when we have uh, um, this, this IO factor in it. Um, and if you go to the, the far right, uh, the, there's not only are you um, diminishing the, immune, the innate immune response, but you're also um, getting higher expression of the transgene. And so this is kind of a virtuous cycle uh, feedback uh, where if you have less, uh, if you have more expression for, for fewer um, copies, then you can go to fewer copies and you have, and that in, in turn results in uh, lower inflammation. So this is, uh, this is one of the first uh, things that indicated that we were on the right track. And this is, uh, um, you know, based on, on wonderful previous literature, not uh, AAV uh, showing uh, this approach to uh, the innate immune. Similarly, we can do in vitro studies on human um, PBMCs, and again, we can see the, the reduced um, innate immune response here. Uh, this is based on um, 11 donors, 
and it's um, statistically significant um, using the same uh, in, in uh, immunity uh, oligonucleotides. Now this is, this is again back to uh, you know, reality check on clinical trials. Here we have uh, um, some examples from the, from the literature of uh, clinical trials uh, where, where we have, uh, it, it's dependent on dose, so if you can get away with really low doses, then you don't see the immune, the immune inf uh, response. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't one, and it doesn't mean that, that, there's, that you're always going to be able to be successful at those low doses. So that's, I think that's one of the reasons that there's some um, either lack of concern or confusion about whether there is or is not a problem with inflammation with AAV. But if you go to practical doses, it is, very, uh, it is often enough that, I, again, I just don't feel lucky. And so that's what you can see is on the far right with the higher doses, you have a lot of incidents that are occurring with the, with the standard vectors. This is all from the literature. This is not from our, our work um, in the references there. And here's some, some uh, title slides uh, from, from uh, so those are human clinical trials. These are preclinical trials in dogs and, and non-human primates. And again, there are enough cases where this is a problem that we want to, rather than, we want to address it. We don't want to hide from it. So it turns out that pigs, uh, you may think I have a particular affection for pigs at this point, uh, having done xenotransplantation, and now we're going to use it in a, in a, in a uh, subretinal injections. But these have been uh, wonderful animals uh, as a better, much better model system than either mice or primates uh, for different reasons. Um, and here you can see some of the uh, uh, doses that we were delivering, uh, and, and IO2, again, just to remind you, is the, um, is, is the uh, innate immunity inhibiting uh, oligonucleotide. Okay. So these were uh, done without steroids. Uh, that, that's, again, another thing that's a confounding factor in evaluating the literature is, and and you will sometimes hear people say there's not a problem, but sometimes it's because they're using uh, a uh, immune suppression protocol that's not really uh, acceptable in, in humans. Um, uh, certainly not. The, if you can avoid it, it's, uh, it's the best uh, strategy. Another, another question that comes up from time to time, another point that is made uh, that is potentially confusing is that, oh, well, the reason that you have problems and we don't is because you, we, I mean, we have uh, bad quality control. Uh, we have uh, dirty virus. Um, I assure you that, that the team that's doing this is, knows how to make virus. Here's some of the, the QC measures that we're using, their standard QC. Um, we're, see, we're seeing inflammation and we're solving the inflammation problem and it's not because you can see the clean uh, viral protein 1, 2, and 3 bands. You can see the, the viral particles. Um, this is something that is uh, endotoxin-free. We're doing our homework here. We hope that, that, that we're representing this uh, accurately. Um, I think the reason we're seeing inflammation is because there is a fairly high probability that it occurs in in a variety of mammals. So this particular case, uh, the, uh, the retinal injection is done uh, in the controls on the left in each of the pairs and the, uh, the IO2 oligonucleotides, just a, uh, just a you know, couple dozen um, uh, nucleotides added to the 4.8 KB um, uh, payload. So it's, not a, so it's less than 5% addition. And in every case, you can see the, the, the gross uh, change in the, in the outer segments. Uh, the pathology is quite evident in all on five out of five uh, pigs that we examined in the study. Um, just again and again, same, same pathology and same absence of pathology on the left with the IO2. And just to be more, you know, 
explicit uh, with quantitative measurements of that kind of data. Uh, we have a sum of the inner segment and outer segment length. This is the cones uh, of, the, of the retina. And you can see this um, significant improvement in um, the length of the cones. This is one of many functional assays that we, that we use for studying this. You can also do uh, optical coherence tomography, or OCT. Um, um, you get a very similar uh, 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 conclusion that comes from this. And this can be done um, in, in living uh, organisms. And it agrees with the, the sort of measures that we, we do by histopathology that we've already shown. So I'm going to show two, two slides here. One is on innate immunity, and then the other is on um, you know, more com complete uh, cellular and, and uh, humoral immunity. This is innate immunity showing that we have the mic microglia activation, which, which the retina shares with the, the, the other parts of the brain. And uh, we're getting activation and infiltration. Again, the, the GFP is the payload here, GFP plus couple dozen nucleotides of IO2 uh, causes a, a noticeable decrease in the, um, in the infiltration uh, of, of, these, uh, of this retina here. That was innate immunity. This is adaptive immunity. The cytotoxic T cell infiltration uh, is uh, quite evident in, on, the, on the left with the GFP and, and not on the right with the GFP plus IO2 oligonucleotide. And this has been uh, done. This is showing two different animals, same, same story, the microglia uh, comparison left and right, and the, and the CD4. Eight T cells left um, control and and IO2. You can also do in life, and like I said we did in living uh, analyses. And one of the one of the animals, I admit this, this is a, a small number, but these are uh, relatively expensive experiments. And and this I'm presenting you where we are progress report. One animal uh, in the control um, had severe um, uh, vitreitis and um, and not in the in the um, contralateral eye. And so this is a summary of many experiments. Um, here you can see the the red yeses uh, throughout are always in the control. Um, that is to say, the 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 AAV vector that doesn't have um, the IO2 and the IO2 um, oligo prevents it in every case by all these different assays, the, the outer segment loss, the microglia infiltration, the CD8 T cells, and the, and the uh, in-life um, uh, vitritis. So the summary of this part, and then we get one la last part after this, is that the immune responses are indeed multifaceted, and we need to uh, pay attention to them. Uh, we hope we have a, a broadly available, something that you can stick in all of your vectors. It may, be, may not even be limited to AAV, but certainly AAV, um, that allows us to cloak this uh, toll like receptor 9 pathway. Um, we really like the large animal model. We think that this is uh, a, extremely valuable, and we hope that people will be using it, um, the pigs and, and, and similar ones in the future. Um, it, I think it will help us dodge other uh, problems. Okay, last topic is due to the work of Pierce Ogden, who is a graduate student in my lab, and Eric Kelsick, who is in transition from being a postdoctoral fellow to um, uh, running a company called Dino, which is turning this into a product. And, and this is not uh, the product. This is just showing how an awesome new machine learning tool can be used to discover something brand new about a virus that's probably one of the most studied viruses uh, ever. We found a new open reading frame. So, so, but we think that the power of, this is just a demonstration of the power of the machine learning platform. I'm, I'm an old time um, <clears throat> molecular mechanics, uh, meaning energy calculations for protein design, and to see this platform just blow past everything that I hold dear is a, is a tough thing for me to admit, but it's definitely, it's sweeping through my lab. We design all kinds of proteins 
um, with this machine learning that doesn't do proper respect to the energy calculations but still works very, very well. And so we've done it for simple proteins. We've also done it for AV, and that's what we're going to talk about here. And so we, we do a design of, uh, and we then synthesize, and we've synthesized now 1.2 million different AAV particles. So these are not randomly mutagenized. These are, these are truly designed in a computational sense. And then they can go through this um, uh, in vivo delivery to, to mice or, or primates. And then we can harvest each of the tissues to find new tissue specificity. I'm not going to show you that data. I showed it last year. Um, but uh, you can get truly dramatic differences in heat maps, so you'll show it in a second, where you, when you harvest the vi viruses to succeed in getting into the, each of the various tissues there. But this is, instead, I'm going to show you what we can do um, in terms of discovering this gene. So this is, this is doing the entire capsid re region um, from stem to stern, every single base pair, every single possible codon chain, so 64 codons at every position of the virus either both substitutions and insertions all, of all sorts. And then we're just going to blow up the green section to look at what some those of you who are AAV aficionados will recognize as the AAP, which is one of these uh, overlapping reading frames in the, in the, over the CAP gene. Um, and here's just the red boxes or little blow-ups of w which we don't need to go through in detail right at the moment, but they're, they show the start codon, which in this case is a CTG, or other later start codons, which are ATGs. And you can home in on those, and you can see what substitutions are acceptable uh, um, in, 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 and which ones are unacceptable, whether they're blue or red or neutral, which is white. And um, and in doing this, you can, you can develop uh, assays for um, where you can scan along the gene and look for evidence of overlapping genes. So, that, so the, the, the challenge is that anywhere you have an open reading frame, there's a lot of information content already due to the main frame, reading frame, which is the CAP. Uh, but here we have uh, uh, the AAP was, was a known uh, gene, and we, the new hypothesized gene is, is MAPE, we're calling it, or M-A-A-P. And you can see this, the, 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 the p-value uh, dips uh, near the beginning of the AAP gene. It's not overwhelming. Uh, you, I mean, you're, you're looking for, for a log 10 to be negative, as negative as possible. So 10 to the minus 25 is extremely significant, and you can see that at the beginning of the AAP. But look at how significant the MAPE is. There's, there's uh, just lot, and this is, this is, this is not just steer, staring at sequence. This is based on all those experiments that I showed you, where we're mutagenizing every possible um, base, every possible codon, looking for things that are deviating um, in one frame without affecting the other frame is essentially what's going on here. So that's the first evidence that we have a, a gene, but we're going to go beyond that. So again, this, these are things where you can affect uh, the functionality. Then we wanted to ask whether, okay, is that open reading frame preserved uh, in, in other uh, serotypes? So here listed on the left are all the AAV serotypes that we looked at, and you can see it has the same CTG, which is an unusual start codon, um, it, it, in principle, encodes leucine, but it actually it's a start codon and not the ATG. And it goes all the way to the stop codon, which is all lined up uh, as well. So we think, so it's conserved, but that's not enough. We wanted to see if it was expressed, and so we made flag tags and GFP tags. And you can see both by immunostaining for the flag tag and sort of native fusion protein fluorescence on the right, uh, that this. Uh, is membrane associated. It's, it's, it's very reproducible, and it's not just in, um, in that one serotype, but we've made these fusions for these uh, four different serotypes, two, five, eight, and nine. So, um, and you might say, how, you know, how, how did we not notice this before, and how is, what is it doing, and what, why is it useful? Um, and for, for that, and also some nuances having to do with uh, how it is deleterious in competitive assays, where you have 
um, you know, multiplicity of infection and so forth, I will urge you to go to uh, Eric Kelsick's talk um, last, last session of the day uh, around um, uh, at, uh, at the end. But the conclusions uh, for my part of this, uh, warming you up for Eric's talk, is that we do have this highly conserved um, overlapping gene. It's membrane associated. It's frame shifted relative to the cap gene. It is essential for forming viral particles and it's particularly significant in, uh, in a competitive atmosphere. And there's the map of where we have the rep gene and, the, and these three genes that overlap, the two genes that overlap cap. So there's still a lot to be learned about even the most studied viruses. So I uh, just want to summarize uh, all three of the topics that I talked about. The first one was about multiplex editing, and I should just editorialize for a moment. Almost everything that, that's good that's come out of my lab uh, has something or other to do with molecular multiplexing. Uh, in fact, my middle initial is M, and I've thought about legally changing it to multiplex. Uh, and the idea there is if people sometimes think that multiplexing is, uh, is like filling a room through a full of sequencing machines. That is not multiplexing. That's parallelization. And it doesn't really save money. It just, it actually burns money because you have more machines. But multiplexing is when you have a droplet of liquid or a liquid in a slide or a, a flow cell that is doing more uh, work than usual. So a normal droplet back when we were graduate students was, would do one reaction. Now a droplet can do a million or a billion reactions. Um, and that's molecular multiplexing and it's analogous to electronic and optical multiplexing that dates back to Edison in the 1800s. It's very powerful. So whenever you see it, we use it for developmental biology. You can see we use it for tissue tropism, for immunology. Again, it's, it's not really reading and writing DNA. It's really Whenever you see something, you should ask, could this be better with multiplexing? Okay. So anyway, so that, that was my editorializing on the one bullet point, which is we, we managed to get to 27,000 edits per cell. But like I say, give a mouse a cookie, we are not satisfied. We're, we're moving on to some of the repeat families like the alu elements um, and the centromeres. The parts of the genome that dirty little secret for the, we have never actually sequenced the human genome. I'm sorry to, to say that. Um, and so, so it's going to be very interesting to be doing mutation and functional analyses on a um, part of the genome which we haven't sequenced. Uh, so perhaps we should uh, sequence it, um, which we will hopefully in the next year or so. And then, uh, and then, then, then these two topics on adeno-associated virus, uh, where uh, hopefully we have something that you all, that all of you that are using uh, AV or possibly other vectors, uh, maybe even non-viral uh, delivery, could benefit from uh, thwarting the innate immunity, which can have implications for um, other parts of the immune system. And finally. Uh, uh, this new gene and other things that you can do with machine learning to do to design proteins um, and to uh, design in particular viruses so um, my conflict of interest short conflict of interest uh, again um, I think maybe we'll, I'll leave it up um, as uh, while we go into discussion there's plenty of time for discussion I think I finished uh, quickly so thank you There are some microphones out in the hallways if anyone would like to uh, ask some questions. And you don't need to stay on script if there's something you want to ask me that I didn't talk about. That's fine. Even personal things. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a personal question while we're waiting for people to come to the mic, which is how many people here have their genome sequence? I mean a high quality whole genome sequence, not, not the SNP stuff. I don't see a single hand. What? Well, two hands, mine and somebody else's. Okay, that's that's typical. I'm not disappointed. I mean, it's it's very, you know, very wealthy, very well educated, very biologically well educated people do not get their genome sequenced, and that's that's a whole other 
story. <laughs> Even though it's now zero dollars and uh, protected by homomorphic encryption and, and blockchain. As, as, are you are the, uh, there's someone in the microphone there and here. Okay. So you thank, first. So thank you so much. I just have a quick question about the way that you've shielded your AAVs and thinking about aging. So you use telomeres as a sort of a mechanism to shield what appears to cells as double-stranded breaks. I'm curious if you've ever put that type of technology into an aged large animal model as those animals have shortened telomeres and might not have the machinery to continue to protect uh, or cloak your AAV vectors. Okay, well, so I didn't expect that exact question. <laughs> but I'm, the, the results that we have for the cloaking oligonucleotides, I don't think are double-strand break related, even though some other parts of my talk were double-strand break related. Uh, it may be helpful in double-strand break, but the toll-like 9 receptor is basically, rec the, well, I should say, the innate response in general is looking for hints that you have an invading nucleic acid. So things like methyl C and um, single-stranded uh, DNA and so forth. Uh, but I think you raise an interesting question, um, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the, the fullness of the, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, I think the research we're doing raises more questions than it answers. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Hi. So how does the title look like of your IO2 containing AAB when you compare to the counterpart that has no IO2? And the second question is maybe you like this question better. Uh, how does it work, IO2? I'm going to need a little, if, if the person behind you could tell me what you just said, <laughs> or, you, or just, you can just repeat it, because uh, uh, I, I just didn't catch So it. you have IO2 containing AAB and the counterpart that has no IO2, and ah. when you compare those two in terms of productivity, uh, how do you compare them? During the production I'm just not stage. getting that one word that seems to be a key word. I'm getting all the rest, yeah. Which one? Tighter. Oh, IO2. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. That's, that, that's my fault. I picked a bad bit of jargon to, uh, to have to answer questions about. So IO2 is cloaking, and the question is... I'm so sorry. I really... He's asking about whether IO2 produces at a different titer than without IO2, those vectors. Thank you. Different titer? Oh, different titer? Yeah. Yield, yeah. No, I think they're the same. Yeah. <laughs> did, I, did I answer the question right? I'm so sorry. Okay, and you had a then, second, second question yes. was the mechanism. And that's going to be an even more disappointing answer. Uh, no, but thank you for the questions. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I've got more about the IO2 vectors that uh, I, I'm just curious about. It seems that in different tissue types um, that even though there's a dampening of the immune response, there's sometimes an increase in transduction with those vectors and it sometimes seems like there isn't. And so why do you think that this is occurring and what do you think it says about um, AAV innate immunology? So let me just make sure, I'm just going to rephrase your question to make sure I understood it. So you're asking why do we get variability? Is that the in question? The, yeah, in the tr transduction phenotype of the um, yeah. IO vectors. I mean, to some extent we're seeing variability in almost everything. Uh, and I, I think what we have, I mean, you could look at it very optimistically, which is that the cases where you don't get an inflammatory or uh, innate immune is, is something that you could optimize away and eventually make that the rule rather than the exception. Um, and that would be nice. And I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying that that can't happen. I'm, I, we banned the word impossible from my lab. Um, but it's, it's, again, it's just do you feel lucky thing. The, other, the, 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 the source of variability in many of these things um, 
is uh, there's genetic variability uh, bet because you know these pigs are not even inbred pigs are not actually inbred. When we sequence the first, the most inbred pig we ever who was not particularly inbred. Um, and then there's uh, stochastic variation, epigenetic variation from, from eye to eye, even within the same animal. Um, so I've, I've tried to give a slightly less disappointing answer than just, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so can I ask a question here? I'm here, in the middle. Oh, middle, yes. Yeah, so I have a question more about safety of trying to uh, suppress TLR9 uh, expression in any cell you transduce with AAV, especially yeah. th since there is a likely that will be more predominant in the liver. So did you guys try to see if there is increased susceptibility to double-stranded viral infections that could happen? That's a good question. I mean, we, we always worry that the f the f when we fix problem one, we create problem two, uh, and, and that may be, uh, it's possible we address that and I don't know it, you know, because I'm not as deep in the trenches as I would like to be, but I, I think it's possible we, we need more work there. That's a good, it's a good, uh, I mean, you know, remember this, these are typically transient, right? Um, and so even if you do create a situation that's not certainly not ideal if it were in every cell of, of the organism for life. Uh, you don't want to inhibit the TLR9, but transiently you can probably get away with it. Now, if you were unlucky enough to get a double-stranded virus at the time that you're doing the gene therapy, then that's, that would be unfortunate, but I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. But the TLR9 will always be suppressed in any cell that is transduced. So as long as you have the transgene expression, you'll also have a TLR9 suppression. Correct. That, that's, that's correct uh, if it is indeed a transgene rather than something more transient. Yeah. Uh, this no, is I think, I think I, you're, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, this is Kai Chan. I work Kai for Chan. George Oh, there we, here we, here's the answer. <laughs> Uh, just, the wanted to, just wanted to clarify on the uh, mechanism of action. So the IO2 oligonucleotide contains sequences from human telomeres that fold into secondary structure. They bind toll-like receptor 9 with high avidity, but they're an antagonist. They don't allow toll 9 to dimerize. So that mechanism of action is via, is via a binding event. Uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the mechanism of action. And I also wanted to add that, George, we have tested uh, cells that have received these AV vectors with IO2, and they can be stimulated for immune responses. And we think that's because uh, AV goes into the nucleus as an, ep as an episome, so IO2 would never encounter a TOL9 in the endosome anymore. So there is no long-term immune suppression. Just wanted to clarify that. Beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> He, you know, Michelle, I think he should be up here, not me. Honestly, really. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of amazing work uh, applying gene therapy to rare diseases. Um, but looking forward to complex disease, in particular diseases of aging, what do you see as uh, the right strategy for that? And in particular, the right next step uh, moving into those kinds of diseases? So that would be, uh, so I'm going to start by saying who the right person to answer this question is, Noah Davidson, and he's here, um, but I'll try. Uh, so, so basically, we, uh, one of my previous postdocs, Pedro de Magalis, who's now at Liverpool, made a, uh, a database, which is, I think, now still standard decades later in the field, for age-related uh, um, physiology and animals and and genes and so forth. And we use that kind of as our Bible to, to pick genes. We pick the subset of genes which are non-cell autonomous, meaning that they, if you, if, even with a fairly low efficiency delivery, uh, if you get enough cells, then they can affect other cells, either nearby or systemically. Uh, so these, these are some of the ways we're prioritizing now while we develop better and better vectors. Um, there's about nine major pathways of aging that have been the subject of review articles. We feel that this is something where we, again, don't want to use wishful thinking. We want to hit all nine of those pathways with 
maybe the minimum number of genes, but it, it doesn't have to be one gene. Uh, gene therapy happens to be a particularly power, I don't need to tell this audience how uh, much better it is than small molecules if you can possibly apply it. Um, so th those are some of the decision-making uh, steps that we're taking. Uh, we're, we're, uh, NOAA has a company, Rejuvenate Bio, that's applying, we, we have this working in mice uh, for five different diseases of aging. We're specifically working on re reversal of disease of aging rather than longevity mm -hmm. per se. Um, and, that's, and then transferring that know-how from, from rodents to dogs and then humans. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. George, beautiful talk as always. And I'm curious about like kind of a little bit more background about IL, uh, toll-like receptor targeting peptides. Has this been extensively screened before? Because like, I mean, you may expect where I'm coming from because these type of peptides can be useful for many types of different gene therapy, not only AAV system. So I just want to know a little bit more background. There is, there are um, prior experiments. We, and we got this from the literature. There's another one that's from the Pseudomonas genome. So it, it isn't necessarily a human specific sequence. It's just a, these are just empirical observations, they have been tested in other systems, and that's why I've been bold enough to, to hope, not necessarily suggest even, but to hope that these will be broadly applicable. But even if they're just applicable to AAV, uh, that would be pretty nice. And if you go for the next target, what will be the next thing other than TLR? What will, what will be the next uh, target other than TLR9? Uh, well, for AAV, we might be done. I'm not, I'm not saying we are, uh, and maybe that's wishful thinking that I'm trying to avoid. Um, you know, there's uh, a dozen of them to go for, and, and each of them have their own mechanism and possibly their own inhibitors, some of which could be produced in cysts, as this one is. Um, you know, aiming for methyl C and other uh, components. I, the answer is, I'm not being evasive because it's proprietary, it's just we, we haven't decided yet. Yeah. I was just wondering if you see this IO2 sequence in any natural viruses. Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't, well, I mean, it's short enough that you could get five base pairs at random, so I, I definitely wouldn't say no, but this kind of explicit repeat, telomere repeat, I think is, would have been noticed, uh, but it's hard to, to claim a negative uh, without, without my blast search in hand. And have, you, have you seen any negatives to having it in the virus? That could... Any negatives to having it in the virus? Um, just to be sure, I should call on Kai again, but <laughs> I would say no, but... Uh, Let's, let's, let's make sure, let's make sure that that's a, a no. Let's, I'm sticking my neck out here, Kai. What do you think? Uh, so we've tested multiple vectors that we have received from collaborators. Inserted IO1 for self-complementary, inserted IO2 for single-stranded vectors, and made them into AV2, AV8, RH32, and multiple other AV62, and multiple other capsids. We have not seen a difference uh, in the titers. So we do not make less, we do not package less vectors. Um, we have not done official talk studies, but we do not see any side effects uh, when we uh, do studies in mice, pigs, uh, and non-human primates. Thank you, Kai. I think that, that Kai is, uh, I, I will calibrate Kai for you. He's quite cautious. I think that was a no. Uh, <laughs> but wait, wait for the phase one clinical trials, basically. Uh, hi, I was wondering if you would care to add a sentence or two on the elephant or the mammoth in the room. I was hoping to hear a little bit more about that. We just couldn't resist, could we? Yeah. <laughs> I, I really, I, I, you know, this is by far one of the most frequently asked questions of me, mostly by journalists, not, uh, and I keep telling them, I say, look, 
you know, you've been hounding me on this topic for 11 years and we don't have any peer-reviewed papers. Uh, why don't you wait until we have peer-reviewed papers? And they say, well, because you're not producing peer-reviewed papers. But anyway, we will have four peer-reviewed papers this year that are relevant, including one that I did the experiment, part of the experiments with my own hands, I'm very proud of. I went to uh, Siberia and uh, personally dissected, uh, you know, large pizza, pieces of meat that are frozen. Um, and we did a, a, a uh, what may turn out to be de novo sequencing uh, uh, relevant technology, a new technology. Um, I think the thing that's relevant maybe to this group is not the in situ sequencing, but uh, the, the fact is that it's an example where we do need multiple edits. We are really, you can think of it as we're trying to, at a minimum, test hypotheses that come out of ancient DNA. It's, it's one thing to just stare at the sequence and say, this is the way it might have been. It's another thing to um, at least get it to, to some point in developmental biology in vitro um, development, which is another thing that we do that we didn't talk about, uh, to see if we can test these hypotheses. To go beyond that to talk about uh, you know, how we're going to help the carbon sequestration in the 19 million square kilometers in the Arctic and Pleistocene Park and our collaboration with the Sergei and Nikita Zemov, that would be another hour. And, and I invite you to, to talk to me uh, later. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. With that, I think we should end. Thank you, George. <laughs>